Next up is Mary Doogie, who is going our current DPL. He's going to share some bits from the DPL. Yeah. Hello, so my name is Mehdi, I'm pretending to be the DPL for the next year, and I'm here to talk to you about what's going in Debian. Uh, so welcome to everybody, I'm glad to be here, I'm glad to see you all here, and uh, so thanks for the DebConf 16 team, I know how the work has been frustrating, and the energy they put in. Um, thanks for them for scheduling my talk during after I mean, just after the cheese and wine party, so that <laughs> everyone is ready for the talk. <laughs> and thanks for the University of Cape Town for hosting us. Um, so, some funny facts about this conference. It's the first time it's uh, organized in Africa. Oops, sorry. Uh, it's really important for us to reach out to new users, new communities, new um, people. So. Uh, it's very important to DebConf to change the country every year and continents. So we're doing also a conference about Linux. It's the first time we're having a conference near Penguins, <laughs> so that was important enough to say it. Uh, it's also the first time we have a DPL born in Africa, and we can, can keep going combining those funny facts. Uh, so the last one was important, um, important for me because it shows how our community is diverse. And we want to, um, I mean, we like it like that, right? <laughs> and uh, we have to keep it that way. Um, so how is Debian going these days? Some changes in the, some teams. Uh, so there were delegations of Debian maintainers queuing maintainers and front desk delegations we were, which were revoked. Uh, the basis of the, for that was that the work didn't need any delegation, any special power to be delegated. Their work was mainly administrative, so a delegation was not needed. Um, the one who needed um, delegation was Debian account managers, which are still there. Uh, it doesn't mean that those teams will disappear. It just means that they don't need any delegation anymore. So everyone is, I mean, it's easier now to help them to get the work done. And it's very important to get it done so, because it's our way to get new members into the community. Um, other important stuff, um, press, publicity, and bits teams were combined. Now we have only one team working on those subjects. So taking care of about press releases, publicity work, and all the communication that happens in the bits blog. Also, uh, we have the anti-harassment team that we didn't uh, maybe um, make big promotion around it in the past, but it's somehow very important in our organization to make sure that everything keeps going well. And we have Laura and Neil who volunteered to join the team recently. So they joined Marga and Patty, who were already in the team. So thanks for Neil, thanks for Laura. It's, it's not very visible work, but it's very useful for our community. And to make sure that uh, some teams don't get um, inactive. I'll make, sh I'll make regular pings of selected teams to make sure there is everyone, I mean, there is someone replying to the questions and doing the work. So, um, what actually, yeah, still. Uh, so some numbers about uh, what we've been doing Lately, I don't know if, not, if you've noticed, but there is only 10 packages in the new queue. What? Yeah. <laughs> the FTP team has been doing tremendous work around that, and they, be, they deserve a th big thank you and big applause. 
I, I mean, I think many people didn't expect that and di were not, maybe didn't see that in years. And it's good to see, in, to see it happening again. It's uh, very important to have people active in the FTP team and the new queue is someone, something that, um, it's just kind of last, last step. So we are doing all the work and now before publishing it, it's held in the new queue until the review by the, for legal stuff on the licensing. <coughs> And so, right, it's awesome to just have only 10 packages. We also have 90% of packages which build in a reproducible way in testing on IMD64. So given the age of the project uh, for reproducible builds, it's like awesome work. I mean, there are many people working on that and they have uh, awesome results. So they also deserve a bigger applause because they, it's Tremendous. So we are also welcoming uh, 29 interns this year, four from Outreachy and 25 from the Google Summer of Code. It also shows the interest of people in our project and the works that could be done. And so welcome if there are any in the in the room or watching us on the streams. Um, also, about Jesse, we've had the shortest freeze, so only 171 days. <laughs> so we want it shorter, but yeah, it's still kind of short. It's like six months or something. And we, I mean, the release team is trying to make it even shorter for the next release. And it's counting on all of you to have a look of, uh, at your bugs and getting things fixed in time. Uh, so that we can enjoy developing things even more for for Buster. Um, yeah. So all those show how what is going on in, the, in Debian. And uh, one question I, I wanted to think about what is um, what made Debian successful, actually. So I try to summarize it in four points. The first one for me is the large active community. The work has, is b done by the community and only by volunteers. And so all of that is thanks to them or us. Uh, second thing is about the quality and stability. That's something that is well known for Debian and people are organizing it. Also the largest package repository, it's one big selling point for Debian actually. And people rely on, the, rely on that to, make, to, not be a, to not be enforced to compile things by themselves and having things integrated in more of one large repository. And the fourth point, and maybe the more important, most important one, is our com commitment to free software and the philosophy of our project. It's documented in, some, uh, in the DFSG and Debian social contract. And it's also in our way in doing things uh, we rely heavily on volunteers and only, and <coughs> sorry, and it's important to um, keep it that way. I mean. So if you want Debian to be still relevant and successful in the future, we have to make sure that those points still hold in the future. Um, so I'm going to speak about the first three um, by the community and the package archive. And my outline for this talk will be talking about the code of conduct, the quality assurance, some proposal for a roadmap, um, trying to gather ideas for how to fund new Debian projects. And finally, uh, I thought it would be useful to, to talk to you about the DP workload. Um, we had only one candidate last year, me. And I hope to see more candidates in the future. It's, it's, um, it's an important role in Debian. Um, past DPLs showed that uh, many things can be made possible with, DPLs, with the DPL support and commitment. So it's very important to have more people interested in that role in Debian. So the code of conduct, um, 
It's a document which clarifies our values and principles. It can be summarized in five points, very simple. So it's by being respectful, having good faith, uh, being collaborative, trying to be concise, and being open. Maybe the most complicated one is being concise. We like the details, so writing long mails is something we know to do, <laughs> how to do. <laughs> yeah. And another important document is the Debian community guidelines, which were, was written by Enrico a few years ago. I don't know if some people heard about it in the past. So, by the way, who did read the Code of Conduct? Okay, that's not, still not 100%. And <laughs> we have to fix that some way. Um, so first, if you have any issues, you have to talk about it. Talk to the harassment team, approach the Debian account managers, talk to people next to you, uh, go to the front desk, orga team, me, whatever. But be sure that uh, someone listens to you. Um, we want to provide a safe environment for our contributors. We want to, I mean, people are coming nowadays with their friends, with their family, with their children. So it's very important to make sure that the environment is safe and uh, people are still having fun. Um, so we have so, some procedures to get things uh, secured in some way. So we still, we, we seem to be going, going, doing fine on that point, but there are still ways to enhance the situation. So first, I think that we should make consequences of misconduct more explicit in the code of conduct. It's kind of blurry of what, what you risk if you are misbehaving. Uh, like, for example, give some explicit examples in the what do you risk? Uh, it's very important to say that y if you are misbehaving seriously over time, you risk to ha get your account locked and getting out of the, of the project. It's, only, it's not only about being banned from mailing lists, because for now the code of conduct says you be not be able to use the Debian's communication systems, <coughs> but it should be more explicit. Uh, also, a reminder about its existence. Some people didn't read it. I mean, that's fine, but we have to fix it. You have to read it, and we have to communi communicate uh, around the, on the code of conduct. Also, um, so nowadays, the code of conduct can be conduct can be seen of some of our core documents, which defines our community, our project. So new members, when they apply to have uh, a DD account or a DM account, can uh, sign up for the code of conduct, just like other documents like DVG and DMAP and social contract. And it's something that is very easy to do. And that way we make sure that people are aware of its existence and its content. So we should be doing that. Excuse me. So now about quality assurance. Um, so we've been packaging pack, um, stuff over time. Uh, the archive keeps growing and growing. We are adding thousands of packages for each release. So it's getting uh, immense. And we used to rely on uh, unstable users to get the archive tested. and heavily rely on them to report RC bugs and make sure that RC buggy packages don't make it to testing. But with this size of archive, manual testing is res, uh, less relevant than it used to be. And we have to need find new ways to make sure that the archive is still of a good quality. So fortunately, as we are some paranoid nerds about QA, I guess, we have many tools. So we have Pupars, Jenkins, Doze, CI, and other tools like we are doing reprodu reproducible builds. We have Lintian. And those are great. But they have to be integrated in some way. 
Um, so CI uh, appeared a few years ago, and we already have 20% of packages covered by tests. But those are not, um, I mean, the effect of the tests being passed or failing uh, don't affect the archive for now. We have other tools like the auto removals. I don't know how many of you realize the, uh, how the auto removals uh, enhance the situation with respect to the, next, to the number of RC bugs, but it's kind of huge. It wasn't introduced there. So we see the drop of packages, I mean, for RC bugs, which is, uh, so the green line is for the next stable release, so it's for testing. And it's when it was introduced, half of them, half of the RC bugs were just like of removed from testing. Um, it's not about hiding problems, but at least buggy packages are st not in testing anymore. And this helped to quite a lot for the Jesse release, because when we started, we didn't start at like 1,000 RC bugs. We started with quite low number of RC bugs. So we've done some archive rebuild here, and then got the thing, got I mean the archive fixed. Um, so nowadays we have the bug tracking system at the heart of our workflow. Um, some tools on the left side file new bugs in the, into the system, um, mainly manually today, but it could be automated in the future. Uh, some tools are relying on what the bug tra uh, tracking system has uh, to make sure that the archive is not buggy. So we have the auto removals. We have also the Brittany uh, program, which uh, produces the testing suite. Um, so we can imagine that in the future, CI tests could prevent packages from migrating to testing if there are regressions or even if the test suite is failing. Uh, there are mo probably more things to do. So it's up to you to uh, look for new ways to test the quality of the archive. And uh, yeah, uh, that's it. So the roadmap. Uh, so that's uh, another subject I wanted to tell you about. Um, there is no doubt about the size of the project. It's quite big, there are many teams, and it's hard to keep up with what happens in Debian. Um, also, communication is not our thing, strength. We don't, all of them, all of us don't um, write blog posts about what we do, about what we are planning to do. Uh, so it's hard to, every contributor to know what other people are working on. It's even harder for our downstreams, which rely on uh, what we produce. And also for users and not non-regular contributors. So we should find ways to promote our work and get it um, understood by our users. And this is not a way to promote our work. We, it's a nice way to see what happens in the archive when it doesn't fail, but um, Otherwise, it's not very efficient. So in the past, we used to have the release goals, which kind of promoted the plans we had for the project. They were um, meant for the next release, uh, were not RC, um, release blockers. And their severity was right too important to let people do NMUs in a timely manner. Um, the thing is, they were bound to the next release, um, so as we are relying on volunteer work, it's not always easy to commit on a deadline, uh, which, is, which can be considered kind of short, of one year and a half. And the release team at some point decided, I mean rightfully, that they were not the good body in Debian to decide on what should be a goal for Debian and what should not be a goal for Debian. So they were dropped. And they have your announce the announcement there. Um, 
but we can be what we can see, right? We have to document what we want to do in the future and what we want to enhance in the project. There are many things to do, but people from outside the project are not aware of them necessarily. Even people within the project are not aware of all the things that could be enhanced. So we have to promote that. So a roadmap, or call it like project goals or whatever, just some way to reveal the gap between what we are now and where we should be doing, what we should uh, be like uh, in the future. It's a way to set priorities, like something in the roadmap is more, um, has more priority than something that is not. Um, we also uh, like a way to set a vision for the project so that people know where we are heading, what we are doing, why. Um, and it can be seen as a recruitment platform. I don't know if you've um, thought about that, but each time I try to recruit new contributors, often they reply to me, but I'm not interested in packaging. But Debian is not only about packaging. There are many ways to contribute to Debian. And maybe with the roadmap, uh, when they will see the, for example, application porting efforts that it be doing, or application converted to new systems or whatever, they will be motivated to get things done because it will be, there will be uh, like some kind of to-do list and it will be easier to uh, understand where they can hang on the system. So it's also a way to motivate people. Uh, when you're many on a, um, on a goal, it's better than when you're isolated. And sometimes we don't realize that we are working all on the same goal. So that's a way to uh, get um, the bigger picture of the project and get things and get people focused on some goals. We could be doing that with smart criteria. Um, it used to be smart, but I dropped to DT explicitly because we know how to do those. We know how to specify a specific goal. We know how to measure some goals if they are specific. We know, I mean, we kind of uh, find volunteers for that work usually. And we have to make sure that those goals are realistic and relevant. So the roadmap should be flexible. If something is not relevant anymore, we should be able to drop it from the list. And uh, if it's not realistic, there is Maybe it's uh, premature to add it to the list uh, yet and uh, kept for the future. So the T was for the time. Goals should be timely, should, uh, we should um, set a deadline, but we uh, can have troubles um, committing to a deadline. So we can say for some, okay, it's ready when it's ready. I cannot commit to a deadline, but Somehow, someone, it will be ready. What, can we, what we can do also is to say, okay, it will be ready in the next two releases. Just not now, because it's big work. Not the next release, but the one after. And that's something uh, which sets some deadline in the future, which is still realistic. Um, so what the problem is not. Um, so it's not about the release goals, because uh, goals shouldn't be necessarily bound to release. They should look after, I mean, and plan for the future. Uh, it's not a way to discourage uh, individual, individual initiative. It's actually quite the contrary. It's to uh, be sure that everyone's work gets the visibility that it deserves. And by putting the, them in the, in the roadmap, you make sure also that it's, uh, you have ways to attract new contributors. And it's not only about packaging work. There are other things that we can, uh, that we can do in the project. Like, for example, we could have goals on our infrastructure. Uh, many things can be done there. I'm sure DSA has a lot of ideas, 
I'm sure that uh, everyone who is maintaining a service has ideas for that. And we should have ways to promote that work uh, and get it more visible. So who can organize that? Um, one way could be to say nobody, because no one volunteers for the work, and it's kind of big work. Uh, we could say that it will be the DPL, but I think it won't be sustainable, and it's not maybe the best place to do it. Uh, it could be the technical committee, uh, because it is meant to give advice to, uh, to developers and give some, um, how do you say? Yeah, it's like an advisory board. So you go to see them when you need an advice, and the roadmap is exactly for that. You have ideas, you want to promote them, and you want to make hang on other projects in, the, in Debian. And it could be the body that in, uh, ensures that all the vision is coherent. Um, constitutionally, it's also a body that is um, uh, renewed every few years. So we can make sure that it's not only a few sets of, set of persons that are um, defining what the project should be doing, which is important for me. Or we can imagine a new team, even if we have many, many teams. My um, preferred solution is the third one, obviously, but that's something that should be discussed with the project. Uh, people should agree on it. And, and the technical committee should agree on it before doing it. Uh, then what we can imagine as goals. So I've listed some ideas I found on mailing lists. Some people say that for producible builds, OK, it's, it's big work, best, but we can focus on the base system at the first step. So get sure that essential yes and required packages are producible. And, or maybe I heard yesterday that uh, the first CD for installation could be made reproducible, at least. Uh, we could uh, get all daemons uh, providing, I mean, packages with daemon providing systemd files, moving from the menu system to desktop files, or CI blockers for testing migration. And I'm sure there are many other ideas. We can reuse the ideas that were published for the release goals for Jesse in the past, or the ones that we didn't manage to finish in time. Um, so you will be um, asked for what you want to do in the project. And it's very important that everyone contributes to the list. So the roadmap. To summarize, it's a way to promote our work. It's um, many people from the outside the project uh, don't get the big picture, and it's a way to tell them what we're working on. It's a way to share a common vision, goals on the project. Uh, and more importantly, it's we have to find um, a decision process to how to organize all that and work on them collectively all together. And if you're interested, there is a buff organized on Thursday uh, where we'll be discussing that. So I hope everyone will join and to see you there. That's all about the roadmap. So now about uh, funding Debian projects. We have some ways to spend the donated money. So we are organizing DevComs, I mean events in general, so DevComs and mini DevComs and sprints, etc. We are also buying hardware for developers to get things um, I mean, done. Like for example, when you have a driver to test, it's a lot easier when you have the hardware for it accessible. Uh, we also spend money on some infrastructure mainly the domains and certificates, but also some servers. Uh, so that's how we actually spend the money which is donated today. 
Uh, we also have other initiatives uh, to extend the security support on our, for our archives. Um, and there are companies who contribute by hiring Debian contributors to get the work done there. So what we can notice is that that's some work that never been covered by volunteer work. And um, it was very nice. I mean, I'm sure that security team appreciates the work that is done by LTS today because everyone uses it. Uh, companies are using, using it. Uh, users are using it. It allows them to uh, keep their systems running for longer. Um, but we have to detect other projects stuck in the, I mean, stuck and not done uh, in Debian. And they could be funded, or we could uh, think about it, find new ways to get them done. And likewise, there is a buff on Friday on that. So if you have ideas, if you've seen projects that don't get, I mean, we, like we've spoken about like in four years ago and nobody stepped up to do, it, to do them. Uh, we could try to think about how to get them done. Uh, so every idea is welcome. So finally, about the DPL work, and I'm thinking as on, I'm on time, right? Yeah. So I'll be quick. Uh, how many requests do you think I get every week, some number. 500. 500, okay, a bit less. <laughs> 10, well, it's actually 10. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's only the requests. So as you see here, um, you have to reply to mails and start some discussion uh, about, um, I mean, what is requested. Uh, so it could be a bit more, but it's not that massive. Uh, it's not what people think about when we are speaking about the DPL workload. We usually imagine thousands of mails and flamers and private stuff, etc. But it's actually not the case. It's going well. Um, how many of you did send a mail to a leader during the past 12 months, for example? You see, not, th not that many. Maybe we have the 10 requests here. <laughs> um, so what's about the daily tasks? So you have the mails. You have to know, I mean, you never know what people will ask you. So you have to be responsive and reactive. Uh, you have to watch your mail. Uh, you have to pay attention to teams that might need you. For example, when we approach DevConf, people might need to do some expenses. And you are usually, usually the last step before the action. So if you don't reply uh, in a timely manner, uh, things get stuck. And it's important for you to be reactive on that. So there are some things about approving expenses and budgets. And the communication part. If you're doing things, you have to communicate about it. You have to be transparent. So I had to, um, I wanted to summarize what it's still 10. Okay. <laughs> uh, summarize what could make a big difference uh, in the job a DPL can do. So it's about availability to reply to the requests and get them uh, going forward. It's about transparency. If you're doing something, you should not hide it because it's very important to communicate on our stuff. It's also about uh, communication. And I put here imagination because when you have something like that in the Constitution, you have to find ways to use it, right? And yeah, it's a way to introduce some innovation and change in the project. And that's actually what make us, uh, makes new things possible. That's actually uh, the only, how do you say? power that a DPL can use to make the project doing new things and going forward. Um, yeah, and I've finished. Uh, just to remind, uh, so if, 
you feel confident about those, please write a platform starting from now. Uh, talk to people, come talk to me, and nominate yourself for the next DPL elections. It's very important, and you should be considering it. And if you see people that you want to see, I mean, if you know people that you want to see as DPLs, talk to them, encourage them. It's very important to get them uh, the feeling that they are needed and they could do good work on that. So thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I'm listening. Okay, we have question RC. We have one quick question from RC. Yeah, Luca okay, he has been preparing his question since <laughs> yesterday, so he's eager <laughs> to ask it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read it with you because it's a long question. Mm. Uh, regarding automated. Yeah, that's not a question, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Regarding automated testing of Debian packages, do you believe only packages in main should be tested, or should packages in contrib and non-free be tested too? For example. At the moment, only main is tested by ci.debian.net, causing the auto PKG test scripts in ZFS Linux to be skipped. Should we limit our testing to packages in main to spend our focus and resources on DFSG packages only? Okay. Uh, it's also related on uh, how we build stuff. In the past, we made sure that uh, packages built for main and on free are built on separate builders uh, so that to get not things um, broken at some point because we never know what uh, non-free software contains. Um, I'm sure we, I mean, if you are providing something to our users, we have to make sure that it's tested. Uh, otherwise, there is no, it's not useful to do it. Um, so he should be talking to Antonio. And see, and see what, how things could be organized. Um, we have another RC question, but let's get yours yeah. first. So you're already looking for your successor. Does it mean that you will not run again? <laughs> no, I'm not look, looking for a successor. I'm looking for people to make the voting period more interesting and to foster... <laughs> Yeah, and to first, I mean, the exchange that we could have during the campaign, because uh, that's um, a way to get new ideas, I mean, expressed. And, that's and for minions to help you, maybe? Sorry? And for minions to help you? Uh, help well, also, yeah, if you are interested, yeah. And if you have ideas, unfortunately, get in touch. Then another quick question from RC. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the Debian project? The biggest challenge? Challenge, yeah. I think is to maintain 50,000 of packages, <laughs> and we uh, should be thankful to our, all our contributors. Any other question? Or should I stop suffering? And <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.